Hey there, it's Patmos and nice of you to join me in this Ostrif food guide. I will be taking you along a journey to show you all there is to know about food in this game so you can hopefully enjoy the game even more by understanding what food does, how it works, how you can get it and how much you need. So tag along and let's go! Before we can dive into all the different food sources and all the different types of food that we can get, we first have to get to know how much food we're actually going to need. So here we have all our villages, we see little kids, we see adults, but how much food will they use? Well, let's click on random adult. Here we have a 28 year old lady. All the adults in this game will consume plus minus 100 units of food a year and drink 100 units of food a year. It might vary a little bit depending on the food variety you offer, how much food you offer and of course how healthy they are. So it can be a little bit more, it can be a little bit less, but on average it should be around 100 units. For a kit that number is halved, so the kits will only use around 50 units of food and 50 units of water. Um, if you know these numbers now, we can easily calculate how much food a family needs. For instance, right here we have a family consisting of two adults and two kids. They both eat 100 food. The kids together eat 100 food, so we need 300 food to feed this family. We can already see if we add up a sum of these numbers, there's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's already 700 food in here, so they have plenty of food for a while. Actually, I've done some calculations, I've loaded up a few games, and I found out that on average, each family will bring around 240 units of food per person as they start the game. So you will have a lot of food available for them. You can last at least two years without producing any food of your own. So these nine families you start with won't starve anytime quickly, and you'll have around two years to set up a decent food supply for them before they're going to actually need some of the new grown food. You have to take into account of course that some of these foods might spoil in a while uh, and so the, the number of food will drop a little bit but you should have plenty of time to start food production and supply them with your own food so they won't starve. When you start off a new Ostriff game, of course you start by building the forester and the clay pit after you've built your initial camp to get wood production going, get some clay so you can actually start to create some village housing for your villagers. As you can see here, I've set up a few village houses which are the average size that you start with. I've also created a very small one and a very big one because now it's time to decide what houses will we build. If you build a house with a garden, of course, it can produce its own food. But there are differences. We can give, we can use the standard size, we can use a very small garden or we can use the maximum sized garden. And what does that do? Well, I'll go over the yields soon, but first I want to show you this. This is a normal average size house. It uses an amount of resources. If we take the smallest one that I've built here, which is pretty tiny, as you can see if I click this, you can see that there will only be a very small garden in there. It will use about the same amount of resources as this house. So the garden size does not matter for how many materials will be used. It also has no real effect on the building time. The only thing you have to take into account if you build a lot of houses with big gardens is the travel time for your people. The smaller your houses are, the closer they are together, the less far they have to walk from the wood source and from the clay source and that saves time. If you build a lot of houses with very big gardens, you might end up not building all nine houses in the beginning, at least if you place them in a row like this, because they will have to walk very far to get all the resources there, taking up a lot of time. But the house itself does not make a difference in cost, so it can be very cost effective, especially in the beginning, to build a few houses with very big gardens so that they can produce a lot of food. Well, how much food do they produce then? I'll show you next. Before we go to the actual yield we get from the different sized garden houses, we need to know when do they actually start harvesting and when did they start sowing. As you may know, a normal farm will start to sow in March and the harvest will start halfway August, but these houses work differently. These will start sowing the ground in starting in April and the last day of May will be the last day that they can actually do some sowing. 
And these will only start harvesting in October. So you can see right here, it's nearing the end of September. They did not start the harvest yet. They will start doing that as soon as we hit October. The farm, of course, will already start to get harvested way earlier. So you can actually already finish the harvest there. And then the, the laborers and the people get home and then they can do the harvest on their own. Now, you don't have to assign people to do any harvesting in their own garden as soon as one of the uh, elders or one of the older kids gets home and they take a little rest they can also uh, do the harvesting and they will bring in all the goods they don't have to go over it row by row they will just stand at a field and we'll take this one for example we'll go take a look here they will stand at a field and it will just be emptied and everything will be in the storage here now let's see as we get closer to the point where they will actually do some actual harvesting here how that works you can see as soon as this hits october and there's adults present they will start to do the harvesting see there we go and they just need to do this little patch so these ones aren't doing everything at the same time there's probably nobody here now that can actually do it already bringing the goods away probably Yep, they're already moving out some of the goods. And now here we can see big amounts of yields. So we got out a lot of food. Question of course is, how much did we get out? Well, I'm not going to go over all the houses and do all the calculations. I'll just put it up in my screen. Now on to the actual numbers. What did we learn? And remember, we have a very small garden, the medium sized garden and a large garden. I did a lot of testing. And I'm just going to show you the test of two years, but I did a lot more testing and the numbers always worked out. So that should be good. So here we go. How did we do? Well, we add with the small garden had an average harvest of around 110, sometimes 120. Could be a little higher, but not a lot. The medium sized garden produced, well, not completely doubled, but sometimes it did, depending on whether it had some fruit trees in it or not. You can see right here that some of these houses have some fruit bushes in them. They will produce fruits and that will cut the yield a little bit back. The more just the regular sized garden they have, the better it is, the more you get out of it. And then you can get at least 200 units of food out of it. And the large garden really produces a lot, over 1500 units on average. Keep in mind that one adult villager will eat about 100 units of food each year. So the small garden house can only feed one person on average. The medium sized garden house can feed two persons, but if they have kids or they have multiple kids, then you still need to get some extra food. While this large garden house can feed up to 15 adults a year, which is actually quite a lot. So there is a big difference between the small, the medium and the large. And especially if you're struggling a little bit with the food, just go for a few large houses because they can really add to your food supply and give you all the food that you need. But these are the numbers. If you want to recheck it, just pause the video for a bit so you can read the numbers again. But this is what my calculations brought up. It's finally time to get talking about farming. Now let's get over the basics first. What you need to do is build a farm. Then you attach a few fields to them. You can just add them as a field. You can make them in all different size and shapes. And once you have done that, you need to set those up to grow a certain type of crop. And that's basically all you need to do. You put in some workers, I usually put in ladies, and then we can start to actually get some farming done. Now, to be fully aware of how farming works, you need to know that as soon as the month of March starts, the sowing will start and they will start sowing in these fields. As soon as a field is sown in, it will start to grow. Once the field is growing, it will grow until half July. Then the field will start ripening and about a quarter into August, the harvest will start and you can keep harvesting until the first day of November when the real winter and the snow sets in and then all the crops need to be in the farm. Otherwise they will go to waste. And for the sowing and the harvesting, you can actually hire laborers. And it's a very good thing to have a lot of people available in your town to help out with those jobs. Because the quicker you sow in a field, the quicker it can start growing. The longer period it has to grow, the more crops you will get out of it. And the same with the harvest. You really want to get all the harvests in before the winter so nothing goes to waste. And a good way to do that is by hiring those extra laborers to make sure that all the stuff is taken off the fields and into your farmhouse 
Now that's the basics of farming. The next thing to talk about in the farms is what can we grow on a certain field? Well, there are basically three types of goods that we can get. We can get food goods for the villagers, we can get animal food out of the farm fields, or we can get production goods. So buckwheat, potatoes and wheat and sunflowers, makes for sunflower oil, are the food sources that you can get out of a farm field. The wheat of course needs to be turned into flour by a windmill and buckwheat and potatoes they can eat straight away. Sunflowers are turned into sunflower oil by the oil maker and they can also get that as food. The animal foods are wheat, barley, buckwheat and linseed. That is a byproduct of flax. You will only get tiny amounts of linseed with a flax harvest. But for instance chickens can eat that which is a uh, pretty easy and cheap source of food for them. And of course we have the production goods, barley for the beer and hemp and flax to be made into cloth which which you can make clothing. So those are the different types of goods that you can have. Now of course I have done a lot of testing with um, how much can we get out of a field this size 2550, 2550 or how much food can we get out of a big sized farm. So let's jump to those numbers and see what we can do with farming. So what did all my testing bring up in terms of numbers? Here we go, check the farm fields that we have on the screen. The smaller fields, 25 by 50. Uh, they're usually half the size of a big field. I've run a lot of testing with this, so keep in mind that these are the average harvests I got out of it. Um, there can be little variations, but this is about on average what you should be getting. And as you can see, um, there's a big difference between the maximum number of units and the average harvest. That is because the maximum number of units is how many land units you are using inside the field. Uh, and that has nothing to do with how much harvest you can get out of it. So keep that in mind. Those are just units that measure how big the field actually is and how much land it's covering. But that, that has nothing to do with the average harvest. So you can forget about those numbers. I've put them in to point that out. I've tested with buckwheat, potatoes, wheat and flax. As you can see, I did quite a few runs with that. And note it here that we can get from a small sized field around 1500 to 1600 units of food. It varies a bit, but well, they pretty much show the same numbers, um, which are actually quite good harvest. I mean, with one small field of buckwheat, we can feed 16 villagers for a whole year and provide all the food that they need. Of course, we're not giving them the food variety that they need. They need at least three different types of food. But with these 1600 units we can feed a lot of population. Now I've also did the testing with the bigger fields of course and is there a difference? Yes there is a difference. Uh, we can see right here if we take a look at the uh, bigger fields that um, the numbers pretty much add up in terms of the average harvest. I mean it's just doubled and the field is double the size but you have to note that in all cases I had a lot of laborers available so all fields were sown in basically at the end of March but mostly halfway March which is within half a month. So there's a very long growth time. And especially with the big farm fields when you have a lot of laborers available and you can get in a lot of work so that the sowing is done real quickly, then you can get a good harvest. As you can see at the last line, the no laborers one, I've set up a field with no laborers, just the five workers that are in there. And you can see that the buckwheat, they were done sowing at the end of March and the average harvest for the far for the buckwheat went down by 400 so to 2800 so just by having no not enough workers available or not enough laborers i have to say we end up with a lower harvest and as you can see the um, potato field was done three quarters into april and we lose a thousand average harvest on it and then the last field was done only mid-May and we lose 1400, which is about half of the harvest that we could get. So it's very beneficial to use those smaller fields because once a field is done sowing, it will start to grow. And the bigger a field is, the longer it takes for it to be sown in, the shorter the growth period gets. And especially when you have like three big fields, the last big field will be sown in pretty late without any enough laborers. And then you can get a very big loss in harvest. That's why I always go with the eight smaller fields or six smaller fields. 
and not three big fields because once a smaller field is done it can immediately start growing and the other thing just have a lot of laborers available they make a big difference the difference between having a lot of laborers available in terms of the wheat production right here which was the last field to be sown in every time is like you get half more harvest if you have a lot of laborers which is actually a lot 1400 loss in harvest means that 14 people will not have food year round so that's a lot you basically need an extra farm field to supply for the food of those people so make sure that you build not too big a fields and if you build the big fields have enough laborers then you can get very good harvests out of all your fields one of the things we have not talked about so far is how to set up your farm fields and I'm not going to do that in this video. The setups you can use are pretty easy because you can make the calculations with the different nutrients that the different crops use uh, on your own. I will make a separate video about this and, and explain to you how you can set up the fields properly so that you, they make the most use of it. And then I will also start to explain about the plows that I have here. But a good thing to note now is, especially in the beginning of the game, uh, there's no real use for plows. Why is this that? Well, you can see that now that the sowing season is starting, the plows will go to the fields first and they have to plow a field, which takes time. And all that time there will be no sowing in the field, so plowing will shorten the growth time. Plowing will not speed that up. All plowing does is restore some of the nutrients that have been taken out of the field last year and put them back into the ground and it will make sure that the crop that you are putting in after the plowing will use less nutrients. So in the end the benefit of plowing is that you can do more crops growing before you need a fallow field to restore all the nutrients. So plowing is very useful but not in the beginning of the game. You will get to that later. In the beginning of the game just stick to your normal uh, two crops and then a fallow field just to make sure you uh, use the most nutrients out of the ground and then you, you have a fallow field to restore those nutrients and preferably get some animals on it because that will help it to restore even further. Um, as you can see here I've set up a farm where they can sow in a few fields while the plowing is ongoing and once this is done they will get to the fields with the plow so there will be no loss of time because some of the fields will still be sown in and others will get plowed first if you only if you use plows on all the fields you can have only three plows per farm then as soon as they start finishing the first plowing they can start to sow in that first bit of land all the other fields will not be done and now somebody will have to go again with a plow plow another field so plowing all the fields is usually not beneficial so don't get into plows in the early game you should get to those in the mid and late game and i will make a separate video about it to explain how you should use those best next up in our food guide Orchards. Orchards are a great way to get food. They provide you with different types of fruit that you can use to feed your villagers and also to add to your, to your food variety. Now once you have built an orchard, it's completely done. You have to select one of three types of fruits that you can get there. Apples, apricots, cherries. In this case, I'm just going to select the apples. We have to put in workers. They will come in, they will plant all the trees that you can already see here designated. So where they have to be planted. And once they are planted, it will take a few years before the trees are actually grown enough so that they can bear fruit. That means that from the third year on, you will start to get fruit from your orchard tree. So the first two years, it's kind of a waste. Now what you can easily do is just put workers in, make sure that they come and that they uh, fill out all the trees. Then you can remove the workers for the first two years. You don't need them. After that, you will start to see your first harvests come in. Um, harvest is typically during July and August. So make sure that during those months you have all the workers in. They will take out all the harvests and they will put it in here. And then of course it has to be transported to a granary. Now, a good thing to know is when you select the right tree type that these fruits will spoil and that means that they will turn bad after a while. Apples will have a shelf life of 18 months. Apricots and cherries only have a shelf life of two months. That means from the second you have harvested them, in two months they will spoil. That means in those two months you will have to bring them to a granary bring them to a market stall, sell them to a family and they have to bring them to their house and eat them, which is kind of impossible to do in two months. So I would recommend 
especially in the beginning, always go for the apples. They will remain good for one and a half years. You have plenty of time to spread them around and make sure that everybody gets the fruit that they need. Of course, a good thing with fruit is once people have fresh fruit in their house, they can turn them into dried fruit, which is great because that means that it will not spoil anymore. So it will remain good for long. But even if you get a, a, a bunch of the apricots or the cherries into a house and they can turn it into dry fruit in time, you will still lose a lot of spoilage, especially because they will usually only buy in the amounts of like 10 or 20 units at one go from the market. So it takes a long time to bring them from the market to the houses, turn them into dry fruit. Um, that's where it's basically almost impossible. So just go for apples in the beginning. Later on, if you want to have a little bit more flavor and you can deal with all the spoilage, you can go for different types of fruits, but uh, just go for apples in the beginning. Let's take a look at the harvest that we can get from the different orchard tree types. Here are the numbers. Of course, I have done a lot of testing with this. These are just numbers from one of the runs, but they match all the other runs. So that should be okay. Now note that the harvest one is the first time we do actually get a harvest. But of course, the trees are already three years old by then. So it takes really takes time before you can actually get the harvest in. So build your orchards early, plant the trees, because then you have to at least wait two and a half years before you can get your first harvest in. Now the apricots, the cherries and the apples all come in around 2000 in the first year. Then the numbers will run up, but they will vary a bit, somewhere between 2500 and 3500. As you can see with the apples and the cherries, the numbers will go up already. Um, around 3500 is usually the average you get once the trees are matured. You can see that on harvest three, the three, the trees are five years old. That's when they are fully matured. And from then on, you should get the maximum yield, but yields will vary each year. You can see that between harvest three and harvest four, you can see a difference of 500 between the apricots in those two harvests. There's a difference of 700 between the, uh, or 800 even, between the cherries and the apples even have a bigger difference. There's no way of knowing what will impact the yield, but yields will just vary every year. But you can count on an average around 3,250 or 3,500. That's around the average when the trees are fully matured. And that's how much you will get out of those orchards. So you can actually provide a lot of food with those orchards. Just make sure you pick the right type of fruit distributed quickly around town and you can have good sources of food out of that. So far we have talked about food from our housing, food from the farms, food from the orchards. So it's time to start talking food from animals. And for that I just made this handy screen where we can see everything there is to know about animals. Here you can see the different types of animals. You can have cows, sheep, chickens and pigs and what they require. So cows, for instance, require hay to eat, which is a free product. You can just buy hay dryers and some hay barracks and the people of your town will start to create hay for you, which is totally free. Cows will use 1500 units of hay during the winter months. So that's 500 each month. There's three months of winter and the rest of the year you can put them in a pasture, which is great because they won't cost you any food or water and they will restore the fertility in a pasture. So always use a pasture. What do you gain from it? You get cow hides, meat and milk. And I guess your main focus should be in this case the cow hides and milk. That's what you get out of it. Milk can be sold in the market for food. Cow hides you can turn into clothing. But those are the most profitable things you get from the animals. You could also get some uh, cow meat. You can sell that too. But I don't think that should be the goal why you should hold your cows. Now sheep are almost the same. They also require food as in the form of hay, which is pretty cheap. They require a bit less. So during the winter months, they will consume in total. If you have a completely filled up uh, sheep shed, they will uh, consume 1350 units of hay. And they also use a pasture most of the year. So they're completely free to have during the rest of the year. They will provide you with wool in the spring, sheep hides, meat and some milk. Now the wool, the sheep hides and the milk should be your main focus. And again, milk you can sell at the market. You can also build a dairy and create products like cheese, which and in this case cheese is the best product because it has the longest shelf life. So villagers can then create cheese, sell it at the market and people can 
uh, keep that for very good. So it is a nice addition for food, but keep in mind that animals might have another purpose, especially these two for clothing. Chickens can have a wide variety of foods, wheat, barley, buckwheat, sunflowers and linseed. And the good thing with that is they don't need everything. You just can provide them with one or two types of food or moreover even more. Uh, so you can play around a bit with what you have to spare. Uh, they will consume around 900 food in one uh, chicken coop. So when it's completely filled up, 30 hatchlings, 30 full grown chickens, uh, they will require 900 food. They'll produce chicken meat and eggs. You get around a thousand eggs and around 600 chicken meat per year per chicken coo, which is nice. And they can be a great addition. They're pretty cheap. They don't eat that much food. And they will add to the food variety in your village. And most of the products will go rather quickly in the market. So if you have eggs and chicken meat available, people will buy them quickly so that's really nice that's a good addition and of course we still have the pigs pigs can eat anything almost so wheat barley potato buckwheat linseed beetroot carrots cabbage and sunflowers but they consume 3600 units of food in a full pigsty which is a lot of food we can feed a lot of villagers with that so basically we almost need to dedicate a whole farm to feed pigs in the pigsty what do you get from that pork and salo and um, they can't go in a pasture, so you'll have to feed them year round, which is very costly. And that's why, in my opinion, you should never get pigs unless you have a very big town and you're bored and you just want to add something to it. There's no benefit to them. They're very costly to have. They produce quite small amounts of pork and salo, and it's just not worth it unless you have way, way, way too much food on your hands. And this is basically all you need to know about the animals. Let's move on to fishing. If you want to go fishing, you need to build a fishing docks and a boatyard. The boatyard will create the fishing boats for you. They will put them in the fishing dock and then you can assign workers to it that will go do some fishing. Now they will catch raw fish in quite okay numbers, but raw fish will in the end spoil. So what you can do is build a salt works or import some salt, tell them to produce dried fish, put in some salt, and they will turn these fishes into dried fish. And the good thing with dried fish is it won't spoil. So you get good amounts of fish that way that will remain good for very long. Note that fishing docks won't work in the winter time when the river is frozen. So during uh, the full month of December, January and February, this whole river is frozen and they can't be used. So use seasonal hiring. Make sure that they are not in here during those three months because they can't work anyway. And during the other months, they can do some fishing. It can be a nice addition of food in your town. It's quite labor intensive. You can see there's five workers and only three boats. But once one of the workers is going home to rest, one of the others can take the boat and go do some fishing. Uh, but they bring in nice amounts of food. And especially in the beginning, it's pretty easy. Just build one or two fisheries in the boatyard. Make sure you get the boats out. And you have that nice extra source of food that you might need to get your food variety going. And it's just a nice add on to the food that you can have. Uh, right now, we don't have any fish in store uh, because a lot of people will start buying the fish as soon as you get it. So be prepared to not see a lot of this in your storages. Uh, if you can spread it out to the village and sell it quickly, that will be very good. But in the end, these can produce good amounts of food for your village. I really hope that this guide will help you understand all there is to know about food in the wonderful game of Ostriv and that you are now able to build lovely and beautiful towns in this wonderful game. Enjoy it!